Welcome back. This is Emily Seal, um, professor at Motlow College, covering chapter one um, in our theater curriculum. If you skipped the welcome video, I do want to encourage you to go back and watch that. I get a lot of questions um, early on in the semester that uh, could be avoided by watching that orientation video. A big part of coming to college is learning how to how to do college. Um, for those of you who haven't um, been in college long, it's important for you to understand how classes are set up, how grades uh, are, which you know grade items are worth more, which grade items are worth less. Part of going to college is just understanding the rules of the game. And so I want to make sure everybody understands what the class is about. So if you haven't watched that welcome back video, please go back and watch that. Another question that I get is about this black cover here because it's different most likely from the cover that's in front of you. Um, we did a program called Include Ed um, and in fact starting in the fall we're actually going to change our textbook because we've had so much trouble with that. And I have these page numbers that I'm following along on but the page numbers that you may be looking at may be two different page numbers and I apologize for any confusion. I'm working chronologically through the chapter and the textbook hasn't changed that much so whatever version you're following along with um, like I said, I'm working my way through the chapter, so thank you for joining this journey with me, and I apologize for the confusion. I'm in the process of making it right, fixing it. So, um, uh, so where do we start with theater? Well, historically, the word theater comes from the Greek word theatron, right? Theatron. And that is the seeing place. So when you say I'm going to the theater means I am going to the seeing place there. You can see that they were majestic and huge. It would have been a lot more like going to a football game than what a lot of us would think about going to the theater uh, because they wore big masks and big costumes, almost more like mascot costumes. Thousands of people in the audience and that seeing place was a holy place. It was a religious ritual which we'll talk about more in the theater traditions East and West chapter. But um, the Theatron would have been an all-day ritual noisy and loud and sacred. So the theater is a place when we're going to define three different ways to define theater. Um, first of all it's a place where you can visit when we get into Roman theater, it changed a little bit. You can see they have fancy facades there um, that would have been very ornate. If you know anything about Roman culture, it was a lot more uh, decadent than um, Grecian culture. You can see the three traditional doors there for Grecian, uh, for Roman comedy. And so, um, and they're no longer built into the countryside. They're more uh, anywhere. A Roman theater was built, you know, wherever was convenient, not necessarily for the architecture of the landscape. A lot of you may have come into theater class being most familiar with Shakespeare. He's probably our greatest poet, our great, greatest dramatist, in, uh, at least in Western culture. The one that we celebrate most often is Shakespeare. So you may know something about the Globe Theater, right? Um, it was uh, circular, it was open air, just like these are outside. The Elizabethan um, Globe Theater has a, a thatched roof over the people who could pay <laughs> and over the actors, but the groundlings would have stood on the ground and would be open to the elements to a certain degree. Um, but uh, that's a Globe Theater uh, from Shakespeare's day. When a lot of us think of a fancier theater like the Von Braun or the Tennessee Performing Arts Center downtown Nashville, we think about an opera house style theater with gilded, beautiful, um, ornate proscenium there around with a fly system, an indoor theater, which is what a lot of us are going to think of. We can see that orchestra pit down front. Our uh, theater in Oaf. 
um, in at the Moore County campus, uh, Powers Auditorium. It is more, not nearly as ornate as the Opera House, but it is in the Opera House vein. Um, it is a proscenium theater. So theater is a place, right? That's what we just covered. Theater is a place, but theater is also a group of people. If you and I and your best friend decided to go do a skit on the lawn at Motlow, um, we don't need a place to do theater. Really, the only thing you need to do theater is an actor and an audience. That's kind of the, the cool, one of the cool things I think about theater is it can be a big, huge Broadway style ensemble of over 100 people, or it can just be a person standing in front of an audience. In Shakespeare's day, his group of men were called Lord Chamberlain's men, and then later, when he got a wealthier patron, the King's men, right? Those were the touring company, the group of players. Um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite theaters, which is Second City. They do improvisation. They do skit comedy. Uh, you may see some actors from Saturday Night Live there. Second City is based in Chicago, and I actually got to go with my husband last year to go see some live improv at Second City, and it was fantastic. But they do have a theater there, but they're, you see, I've chosen here a, a touring company logo because they can do theater anywhere right it's just people having fun in front of other people so what are some of the people there's me hi <laughs> um, what are some of the people the occupations so theater can be a place theater can be a company or a group of actors a, a, an actor in front of the audience theater can be an occupation right theater is work and it can be hard work it's fun work I think but there are some people who get up and do uh, that's what they go to work so a director is the person who provides a unified vision supervises rehearsals coordinates schedules but gives a unified vision so this is um, a recent picture of me from babes in toyland I directed that project um, and I direct a lot of plays at the Moore County campus and uh, the director is we'll talk more about that later but once again they provide a unified vision they develop and control the artistic process so that's kind of what a director does sometimes the director picks the play if the producer doesn't so that's another fun thing about a director and once again these aren't people uh, this is a class project but it helps to so this is Jawan uh, those of you who are current students you might uh, recognize him he's also a current student I think a lot of us probably know what an actor does um, but they're the most visible you know when I go over all these roles you may not know about you know what a crew member or you may not even be able to recognize them after the show um, but the actors are essential right they perform the roles and we can't do theater without an actor right so this is Kurt Krauss he is a uh, scenic designer and he uh, is a fantastic woodworker kind of a jack-of-all-trades but particularly a craftsman when it comes to working with wood so he designs the sets for our Moore County campus plays and builds them he kind of does both he both uh, designs and builds so it's not uncommon though for especially in larger theaters for those to be separate jobs one person's kind of coming up with it and another person is uh, realizing it um, I've even worked at theaters where the design came from someone in another city and they didn't even ever come and meet with us they just sent their designs to us and we built based on their plans so um, we are lucky at Moore County here to have Kurt Krauss and he both builds and designs the scenic elements to our plays um, he does this is not Kurt <laughs> I don't have a picture of Kurt painting uh, but uh, if you go into any theater they're gonna have backstage shops whether it be a paint shop like this one or a costume shop with sewing machines they're gonna be tools to create these um, these design elements so they are the designers and they are the builders uh, this is Eric Peterson at our Moore County campus he's running the uh, sound 
booth there. You can see him sitting at the sound board. Um, crews are technicians who um, work either backstage or in the shadows, as it were. It can be a run crew, like during the show. Um, you can see Eric was pressing the buttons to make sure that the microphones were on and pressing um, the sound effect buttons on the CD player. Uh, and he was working with live cues, but a crew can also be a prep crew rather than just a run crew. So the prep crew might be the person who's laundering the costumes or building the set. Um, so crewing, shifting the scenery. If you see a stage hand on stage during the play that you watch, um, moving the scenery around, they would be considered crew. So a lot of the time you can see Eric's wearing a black sweater there. Most crew are going to wear black because they're trying to be in the shadows. They're not necessarily, depending on the style of the show, but not usually going to be in the limelight the same way that the actors are. So those are just some of the vocations that you will meet if you meet somebody who works in the theater. So um, most of us know about actors, but all that other stuff, and there are many, many, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the um, chapter on technical theater. So so theater is a place. Theater is a group of people, uh, a great group of people, if I might say so myself. Theater is a vocation or occupation for some people. Um, it was for me for many, many years. Now I'm teaching it. Uh, theater has a lot of similarities to sports. So um, theaters that started you know, in these theatrons were running alongside the Olympics right? So we have a lot of the same shared language. We, we're called players as our um, sports uh, players are called players as well. Uh, you know, we have season tickets just like a game. It's another form of entertainment. So uh, there's a lot of shared history between um, people who are actors, uh, the, the whole theater and the sports. So what else can we compare theater to? This is my son, Elliot Judah. He will turn four next month. Um, but this was him at Halloween, and he wanted to dress up like Chase from Paw Patrol. And he really enjoyed having a tail. I think he wished he's, he always had a tail. But um, just like we have um, players in sports, we have play, just like children play. And it's not just in the English language that plays are synony synonymous with theater. You can see in your book here, German, Spiel, um, Chinese, Xi, these all sort of have a relationship between being, synom being synonymous with children's games. And that's because, you know, we're playing dress up. We're uh, imagining a reality, and that's a fundamental, important element of your psychological development is to kind of have these plays and play theory. And w we think of play as sort of a fun, whimsical thing that we do, and it is, and it's also pretty important to our mental health for us to have fun and play. But there's a darker side to that, right? When children are thinking about a game like hide and seek, as it outlines in your book, that's a really deep-seated fear of separation anxiety that they're dealing with. So we write plays not only about happy comedies or romances, we write a remarkable, a remarkable amount of plays about the end of the world, about devastation, right? Because we, as conscious people, have to start to think about, you know, what would happen if we like to sort of prepare ourselves for tragedy or for a worst case scenario. And so plays play an important psychological part of our lives, right? They, they help us to sort reality. And we'll talk more about that next uh, lecture. So theater is like a sport. Theater is like a child's play. Um, but theater is art and theater's a combination of all the arts together. So we have dance, we have music. Um, you can see here I have a 
picture from Wicked, which is one of my favorite costume designs. Uh, just beautiful costumes and all of those things, um, creativity, imagination, abstraction, harmony, beauty, uh, theater encompasses all of that, or it can. Um, it is, I like to think of it as soul food, right? Um, I'll, I'll skip lunch if it means I get to go see a play and that will feed my imagination, that will feed my um, soul, it will satisfy me on a deeper level. Uh, like for you, it may be a good song that you like to listen to in the car. That art, that beauty uh, nourishes you on a deep level. So, um, theater is art. Theater is impersonation, right? Theater is impersonation. So, unlike the other arts, performing arts involve personifying a char character or impersonating a character. So, we know that uh, Christian Bale is not Batman, <laughs> right? Um, but we know that Christian Bale is impersonating Batman when he puts on that mask. And traditionally, the mask has been that symbolic barrier between an audience and an actor, right? When they put on that persona in the Latin, that mask, they're putting on this separation. And um, there's a lot of sacred ritual that went on with a Grecian mask and putting that on and believing that you were being inhabited by the souls of that person you were representing and inhabited by your ancestors. I don't know if you've ever seen that Jim Carrey movie, The Mask. <laughs> it's quite a few years old. I don't know if you have. Uh, but that that's actually rooted in a lot of superstition about masks. And that was also true of um, Japanese monks, which we'll talk about uh, but the mask is meant to separate the audience and it's meant to be putting on an impersonation and that's sort of what is at the heart of theater too is impersonating a character pretending to be someone else um so now when we say um batman and christian bale you may think of a different batman right um my favorite batman uh is the Tim Burton's directing, you know, Batman, the one, um, so you, depending on how old you are, you might think of a different Batman, and this is just another little uh, thing that gets confusing in theater. If you would, when you're writing your play critique at the end of the semester, make sure you always use the character name when you're talking about plot and the actor's name when you're critiquing their performance. So I put a little word in that, in the directions for it, but you wouldn't say, um, Judy Garland ran into a scarecrow, if you're talking about the Wizard of Oz, right? You wouldn't say Judy Garland ran into the scarecrow. You would say Dorothy ran into the scarecrow because you're referring to the character or the person. So keeping those things straight um, helps us to clarify our conversation. But it's you can see how it's easy to blur the two between, right? Who is the actor and who is the character? Where does the character begin and the actor end. And it's actually interesting, Dionysus, the Greek god of theater, is the god of blurred lines. He's the god of wine, you know, what's real, what's not real, well, you were drunk, you don't know. Uh, the, the god of sex, not of fertility, um, but, you know, Robin Thicke elegant, eloquently called it the blurred line there uh, in sex. Then he's the god of theater, what's real, what's not real. And um, Dionysus is that god of all things with blurred lines. And it can be confusing for us to keep the characters separate from the actors. And all the world's a stage, right? We all put on some sort of performance at some point in our life. There are just that's the way that our sociological system works is that you behave one way in front of your grandmother you behave another way around your best friend you behave another way when there's a child present if you have good social skills then you act appropriately at different points in your life um, sociologists would call that code switching and the way that you talk on the phone when you answer the phone at work is probably different than the way that you would um, talk to your best friend on the phone, 
right? So we are the faces we wear. You contain multitudes. I contain multitudes. You are all of those people. And when you try on those different parts that you're playing, uh, it is good and right that you be all those things. Now we all know people who take that to an extreme, who are duplicitous, who are con artists, right? But um, I just want to encourage you, especially some of my younger listeners, if you're a dual enrollment student, um, if you're um, young in your development, just know uh, that you contain multitudes and you can try on all of these different sides of yourselves and you can be all those things, even if they contradict themselves sometimes, um, because we are complex creatures, right? So. When we look at typecasting, uh, we look at these actors and we know they're playing characters that are very close to their own personality, right? So their relationship with the character they're playing is not a huge step as performance, right? There's not as much of a mask there. And so um, what is the difference between... A character you play and the person you are doesn't have to be hugely different and some people will criticize typecasting someone like Meg Ryan who always plays that one kind of character well and um, I, I don't think that it's wise to sort of discount that Charlie Chaplin only played one character that silent hilarious character but he played that one character really really well so it can be you know acting it can be a having someone like Meryl Streep who can play lots of different kinds of characters is an asset but there's also something to be said for playing one character well so the no masks like I said that is the ancient Japanese style of theater where um, we look at these different archetypes and if they were wearing a certain type of mask you could tell just by looking at them who they were and so the mask is an idea it's a presence it's a separation it's um, serious and for no masks they were very uh, stories of life and death stories of mythic proportions of gods and and demons, right? Commedia dell'arte, not so much. These are funny characters. You can see this one in the bottom that has a big wart. He's a slave who um, is tricking his master there in the middle, the red one. So masks can be used with gravitas and spiritual importance, or masks can be used lightheartedly to represent stereotypes, as it is in Commedia dell'arte. So just to review, the mask is a separation, a symbolic separation between the actor and the audience. And it um, is not always, um, it, it represents impersonation, right? The idea that you're putting on someone other than yourselves, which is, we don't often perform in masks anymore, right? It's, it's not in fashion, but it still represents theater in a meaningful way. So when we think about what is theater, we've already said theater is a place, theater is a vocation, theater is a group of people, theater is like child's play, it's like sports, theater is art, theater is impersonation, and now theater is a relationship to an audience. Theater is a performance, right? So maybe you've never been in a play, but you've been in a band concert. You've been in a dance recital. You sang in the choir at your church. You've had a relationship to an audience. And this is really what separates film from theater, right? Uh, the sense of reciprocity between an audience and a performer. So if I'm performing in front of a live audience, I adapt that performance. I react to the live audience that's in front of me as opposed to the asynchronous uh, relationship I might have with a screen, right? So a good um, actor knows how to feel an audience's energy, how to relate to them, how to uh, either be fueled by their energy or um, how to you know, calm them in moments uh, when, when they need more focus. So 
like we said, all the world's a stage, right? In this situation, a schoolyard fight, we have a little bit of theater in everyday life. We have an audience watching a performance. If I think about uh, wrestling or these other sort of very theatrical schoolyard fights, <laughs> Uh, even our judicial system has an element of theatricality to it. Some of you like to watch those uh, shows like NCIS or these courtroom dramas, right? That person on the witness stand is, on, in a sense, on a stage. Some of you are putting on little dramas in your interpersonal relationships, right? He's getting punished and she's putting on a little show there to show him how punished he is, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so theater happens in real life. All the world's a stage. And uh, not saying he didn't deserve it. I don't know what happened. So there are two types of relationships with an audience. And some scripts have it sort of ingrained in it. So a presentational mode is when we look directly into the audience's eye and make direct contact with them. Right? So I have a, a picture here from, um, why can't I remember the name of that movie? Ding, dang it. Ferris Bueller's Days Off. And he, there was a moment when he's playing sick in bed and he looks directly into the camera and says, they bought it. Right. And this was breaking sort of the rules because at that moment in film history, it wasn't fashionable for the actor to look directly into the camera uh, for a regular film. So that that's, I have Ferris Bueller here as an example of presentationalism. So if you're at a jazz club, there's a good chance that the uh, musician's going to get on the mic and speak directly to the audience. If you're watching stand-up comedy, there's a good chance that your stand-up artist is going to speak directly to the audience. Um, so that would be called presentational, right? We are presenting this, we're admitting that this is a show and um, direct address. We have soliloquies, curtain calls, all of this is directly presenting, presentational to the audience. So this is the Globe Theater. I got to go here on a um, Tennessee uh, Consortium for International Studies, or TENSIS. And so uh, that was a fantastic experience for me. It's just a recreation of Shakespeare's Globe in London. And uh, being a huge Shakespeare fan myself, this was a huge um opportunity for me uh, and one of the things that I really enjoyed was the presentational moments where the actor would come right down to where we were standing on the ground like those groundlings and look you right in the eye as they're talking to you and it's just so cool you can reach out and touch them if you want to you'd probably get kicked out but uh, it's cool to really be able to be that close to direct direct address to the audience. So when Shakespeare's Hamlet asked to be or not to be, that is the question. That's a soliloquy and it was meant to be given directly to the audience and so that would be called presentational mode. Right. There are some other students who traveled with Tensus. A few of those are uh, Tullahoma uh, Motlow students. So the Moore County campus you may recognize them. Um, and we got to stand right there next to the stage, and it was awesome. And you can tell I'm geeking out, taking lots of pictures. So there are types of theaters that are making a direct address even more um, part of their presentation mode. This is Blue Man Group. They even pull people up on stage. My introvert husband hates that. <laughs> uh, but it's, it adds a level of interaction that you can't get from film. So what's the difference between seeing a play in the theater and a movie in the theater? And so plays, now that there's so many film opportunities, I think are you know investing more in... Um, this presentational mode and pulling people on stage. Uh, so this is the play we saw, A Midsummer Night's Dream, which as I'm recording this is actually the play we're doing at Motlow right now. So during parts of the plays it was presentational and at other times it was representational. So this is what most of the television and movies that you're watching are. That means that they don't make direct address to the camera or to the audience, right? So we are just looking in on their reaction reality, right? Um, the illusion of the fourth wall. We're just peeking in through the window of their life in on what's going on. 
And so this is the young lover scene and they're fighting. You can see Hermia there has just been called short and she's yelling at Helena uh, saying, though she be but little, she is fierce, right? So she's taking her eyes out there and uh, we are just watching this fight happen. She's not yelling at the audience. She's yelling at Helena. So um, William, uh, sorry, Samuel Taylor Coolidge believed that this type of theater where they don't make eye contact with the audience, where they don't directly address the audience, helped the magic of the theater happen, helped you to do what's called suspending your disbelief, which is um, means that you are willing yourself to believe the story. Have you ever sat next to somebody in the theater who's like, that would never happen. He would never say that. That's not how real life is, right? They're not actually letting themselves enjoy the story. They um, have trouble suspending their disbelief. And if it's a bad play, you're probably going to have trouble getting into it, right? Um, For one reason or another, you may not care deeply about those characters or feel what they feel. And um, Samuel Coolidge believed that Presenting plays in this representational style helped us to stay in that world of the play, in that reality, to lose ourselves in the play, which he thought was definitely a good thing. So there are extremes, right? We'll talk a little bit about realism. We'll talk about naturalism um, that was super representational. And uh, like I said, the Blue Man Group is an example of extreme... um, presentationalism but a lot of plays kind of have a mixture of the both right you might they might not make eye contact with you during the play but they will during the curtain call Uh, like I said for Midsummer Night's Dream we saw it in the in the globe at times they would look you in the eye and then other times it would be just the reality of what was going on between them so presentational and representational relationship with the audience So when I did touring children's theater, I found a lot of children's groups were more willing to imagine, more willing to suspend their disbelief. They really got invested in the play as they watched it and gave you verbal feedback so that you could feel how uh, imaginative they are. And so uh, we do a children's shows at the Moore County campus every fall and it's just so fun to hear them boo and the bad guy comes on or um, shock and gasp when the beautiful princess walks in. They really get emotionally invested in these plays. I want to challenge you when you go to see the play to try to capture that childlike wonder. Try to let yourself um, lose yourself in the play. It's really going to help you enjoy your experience. For some t- some of you, that'll mean trying to leave your worries at the door, trying to focus on what you're doing rather than um, being uh, trying to do your grocery list in your head while you're watching the play. I even had a student recently admit to me that uh, he had his phone out during the play. Please, please, please don't do that, especially if you're going to pay the price of admission. Um, be there, right? You've paid your you paid your price of admission, be there, be where you are, uh, not to be all um, preachy at you for a minute, but try to be present when you watch a play. It's, it helps the actors, it helps the audience energy if you're participating. So, And that doesn't mean sitting silently, right? It means clapping, it means laughing when you find something funny, it means uh, verbally reacting when, when it's appropriate. So... Um, So one of the really kind of cool things about Midsummer Night's Dream and Shakespeare in general is the sort of fantasy element of it. And we as audience members can buy into that, right? We can help ourselves believe that Peter Pan is flying, right? We can see the wires, but if we can suspend our disbelief, we can go there in our imagination. One of my favorite moments in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream is when the fairy king, his name is Oberon, says, I am invisible. He just announces it like that. No green screen, no special effect. He just says to his audience, I am invisible. And we'll overhear their conference. We'll overhear their conversation. And then the lovers come in and they're walking all around him and pretending like he's not there, right? They're, they're, they have been told that he's invisible. And we as an audience are supposed to, if he says it, then that's what's real. I have some 
students who say about um, Stephanie Meyer's books, uh, you know, like the Twilight series, well, vampires don't twinkle in the sun. Well, if Stephanie Meyer in a fantasy book says that vampires twinkle in the sun, then vampires twinkle in the sun, right? That's part of the fun of the theater is that the playwright sets up these rules of the game and then we as an audience are just along for the ride. We're just there to enjoy it. So, um, uh, so what's it like to act in a play versus acting in a, um, movie? So we have some quotes here at the end of your chapter. Daniel Radcliffe, who's probably most famous for Harry Potter, Potter. I love this stage and I love being on stage and the rush and the fear and all of that. So when you're on stage, the show must go on. When you do a film, if it doesn't go right, you can call, cut, and re, you know, do that line. But part of the excitement, part of the thrill of the stage is that you, the show must go on, right? So I was doing repertory theater and I just have to share with you one of my actor nightmares. So I come in on the Sunday matinee and the house lights don't go out. I'm supposed to give a two page monologue setting up the exposition of the play and the house lights just keep not going out. That's my cue to start my monologue. They keep not going out and I had a panic attack right there on stage. I had done this show probably a dozen times before that moment. Um, but in that moment, I froze. And it was terrifying. It was horrible. And a few minutes later, I kind of picked up somewhere in my monologue, did a few lines from it, and got off the stage. This is professional theater, right? This is paying customers. Uh, so theater can be fantastic when it's good. It's good, but bad things happen, right? And uh, it can be absolutely terrifying. Um, and that's part of kind of the fun of live theater, I think, for the audience at least, not always for the actor, is that anything can happen right? Anything can happen in those moments and uh, you just got to keep swimming and make it work. So uh, I'm happy to say that that was the only time that happened in the run of the show. I got out there and did the monologue many more times, but every time I was very cognizant of how fragile the whole environment was and making the magic happen doesn't always happen. So there's a relationship between an audience and an actor. Uh, this is the Apollo Theater, which is very famous for booing their actors, their acts off stage. More often, it's musicians, not actors, at the Apollo. But uh, with live performance, the audience becomes part of the experience, right? They can greatly contribute to the play, or they can uh, take away from it, right? I think a big part of going to a live theater performance is going with other people who also enjoy the play, right? So um, sitting next to my friend who tears up during the meaningful part or gets excited. You know, we, I took a group of students to see Phantom of the Opera and um, when the chandelier falls and they all gasp and sort of jump on each other, right? It's, it's a group experience. It's something that we do together. Traditionally, the theater has been a very dangerous place. Uh, President Lincoln uh, died in the theater, right? William Booth shot him, an actor, uh, shot him in the theater, and that's where he died. Uh, he's not the only one to die in the theater. There's lots of people in a theater, and uh, there were lots of fires in London at the turn of the century in theaters. There have been a lot of... Um, angry mobs come out of theaters after seeing a play they didn't agree with and start riots in the street. Theaters were historically sort of dangerous places to be. Even in Shakespeare's day, they had bear baiting. It was on the river where there was a lot of prostitution. It was sort of the bad side of the tracks. So theaters have not always been safe places to be. So 
So theater is a relationship with the audience. Theater is um, a live experience that you as an audience member become a part of. And if you can suspend your disbelief, if you can be present in that room, then you help make up the magic and you help make that theater uh, what it is, right? So uh, if we look at a theater, there is a process for performance. And often that process begins with a script and reading a play. And um, we in the rehearsal process, uh, like I said, we're working on Midsummer Night's Dream right now. We just had our first table read, which with Shakespeare is always a little bit of intimidating to sort of get through all the these and nows and all the language barriers. But uh, uh, reading the script is kind of a good place to start. The play is the thing. The story is the thing. And that script sort of starts us off. And we'll talk next class about what is a play, what is a good play, and just want to remind you that one of the requirements for this course is a secondary text, Joe Turner's Come and Gone by August Wilson. It's a short play. It's something that you can probably read in an afternoon. Um, and August Wilson is probably in my top three favorite playwrights of all time. Um, he writes with conviction. He represents the lower classes. And as you'll read in Joe Turner's Come and Gone, he represents Tennesseans in a way that maybe the history books don't always remember to represent us uh, as resilient people, as people overcoming great obstacles in order to do um the things and achieve our dreams. So Joe Turner's Come and Gone is poetic. It is beautiful. I want to challenge you to um, not try to dissect it too much when we'll talk about that in your character analysis. It's poetry. It's very poetic. And uh, so enjoy it for what it is. So that is the end of chapter one. So theater is a lot of things. Theater is a huge part of my life. I teach it. It was my vocation. My best friends are in the theater. It's what I look forward to. It's my soul food. It's art. It's entertainment. It's child's play. It's a lot like sports. Um, a lot of you I've learned from reading papers have never even seen a play and that's okay. That's why you're here is to start to orient yourself to these um, parts of culture that maybe you've never been exposed to. So welcome and um, thank you for listening.